Hello everyone, it's Wayne Jones, the Course Coordinator for Australian Employment Law. An interesting week this week, dealing with working hours and leave, and uh, the reading comes from Stuart's Guide, Chapter 11. If you're still interested in knowing more about um, the topic, then have a look at Creighton and Stuart at uh, Chapter 13, particularly 13.3 to 13.6. The um, textbook talks initially about uh, ordinary hours of work and uh, I think one of the first concepts to get your head around is that it's not just the number but also the span of hours. So ordinary hours of work um, it might mean uh, for example uh, whatever it is seven and a quarter hours at your workplace somewhere between you know this time and that eight o'clock in the morning and six but it also talks about the days so the span. Um, Section 20 of the Fair Work Act tells us that uh, 38 hours is now the presumed number of uh, hours that a person will work uh, if they're a full-time employee and they're agreement or award free. And section 147 tells us that um, uh, the awards, the modern awards, uh, should specify the hours for that particular workplace. Now remember we've been saying throughout that the Fair Work Act keeps coming back to flexible arrangements. So it's entirely possible to make flexible working hours with the uh, employer um, and the employee and this is where it often gets a bit interesting. Um, many workplaces these days use longer periods. So they'll look at uh, 76 hours a fortnight or 152 hours over uh, four weeks. The sort of place that comes to mind for me in my immediate area is the prison. Uh, they've extended their working day just because it's a complex process getting in and out of the place and so there's a certain amount of time wasted at the beginning and the end of every shift. So they've taken it out um, the last time I looked to about 12 hours. So consequently they, um, uh, they look at the number of hours over a shorter period. So more days off are traded for longer spans of hours in a day. Working time can be flexible under modern awards and agreements and remember we talked uh, when we were discussing um, both modern awards and agreements about the requirement to have a flexibility clause in there but how it had been somewhat limited because unions had kept pressure on so that only particular parts of agreements could be subject to flexibility. Well this is one of them, working times. For the employee, have a look at section 145 capital A. It says that the employer has to consult over any proposed change to regular hours and refusal to accommodate might in fact constitute unlawful discrimination. So have a look at section 145 capital A. Now under the National Employment Standards, section 65, the employee may request flexible working hours and we'll come back to this in a little while when we talk about pregnancy and uh, uh, about leave, maternity leave. Um, it has to relate to some caring responsibility so not just that you feel like working more flexible hours but it re relates to some sort of caring responsibility you have and we'll see this phrase repeated again in relation to other types of leave. It can be rejected on the basis of reasonable business grounds and section 44.2 says that um, there is no appeal uh, once the, the employer has at least considered the request. Um, oh and just before I leave that it is uh, also possible though for the award to simply say that all right well there's no appeal to a court but we will go through the dispute settlement process um, in the workplace if we can't reach agreement. Now the text also talks to you about uh, the issue of overtime and um, it's most commonly understood to mean uh, working in excess of what the normal span of hours is. So you're working uh, more than uh, the, the hours that are normally worked in a, in, a, in a week or in a period that's been agreed. Might be a fortnight or a month. Um, what can't be asked for is um, an unreasonable uh, or for an employee to undertake unreasonable um, overtime. There are a couple of examples given there um, in the in the textbook, um, but uh, do also do also be aware, as the as the authors tell you, that uh, uh, overtime can mean weekend work. 
So, as I said before, you look at the span of hours, and not the hours, not just the hours in the day, but whether those days are ordinarily worked Monday to Friday. So, if they're not ordinarily worked Monday to Friday, overtime overtime can also mean weekend work because it's outside the normal um, span of hours. Uh, and what's the payoff? Well, the payoff is usually penalty rates. Been a lot in the paper recently about the removal of penalty rates from certain areas, particularly hospitality. But at the moment, uh, most modern awards um, still refer to some form of uh, penalty rate uh, as a loading or a premium for working extra hours or, or antisocial hours. So lots of uh, shift workers, for example, have an entitlement to a loading on the usual wage. Uh, they apply to additional hours at different rates. So if we're talking about quite a few hours over the normal number of working hours, they might be they might start off at time and a half and then go to double time. Um, and penalty rates also are what we refer to around weekend rates. They can again be dealt with under individual flexibility arrangement clauses because that's what the new Act is all about. Uh, and sometimes they're dealt with by way of um, an annualised salary. So they're taken into account so that the employee is allegedly better off overall. Shift work, meaning working around the clock. Uh, lots of mine sites, lots of manufacturing businesses, etc., working around the clock in shifts. The award provisions there, and perhaps the best thing to do would be go back to Fair Work um, and have a quick look through some of the awards that do include um, penalties for shift work. Um, they might also talk about not only money but uh, restrictions on the length of the shift, uh, notice that's required for a change to the shift, loading and penalty rates. Uh, they can be modified if the better off overall test is satisfied. They might even provide for an employee to receive more leave. So instead of getting four weeks annual leave, a uh, shift worker may receive five weeks annual leave. Just in relation to rostering and changes, um, and I'm looking um, uh, looking at 11.10 uh, in the textbook. Just note these things, that uh, the uh, awards and agreements may often refer to minimum shift lengths. So calling somebody in for, say, not less than three or four hours. Um, you'll see that often in arrangements regarding retail. So p someone gets all dressed up, comes in, pays the cost of transport to get in there, they'll expect to work at least three to four hours. Um, minimum breaks between shifts, and there's probably a safety element to that as well. So the award or agreement might refer to um, just how long there has to be until the person can be called in for a next shift. And then us, there must also be consultation prior to the changes, to any changes being made. Have a look at section 145 capital A, and uh, 205. And again, as I referred to before, um, you don't have any right of veto over these things. It's more about consultation prior to change. Um, maximum hours and the National Employment Standards. Have a look in Division 3 of Part 2.2 of the Fair Work Act for more information about maximum hours under the National Employment Standards. Section 62 presumes it'll be a 38-hour week unless extra hours are reasonable. Now, employees may refuse to work unreasonable extra hours. Section 63 says, well, you can average out, so that's, that's fine. That might be how you come to be working some additional hours, but you can't do it for more than a six-month period. The hours in any given week, though, still can't be unreasonable. So you really can't load up one week with an unreasonable number of additional hours. And it's, uh, the Act still requires that, even if it might look reasonable on the surface, you still need to consider the employee's personal circumstances, family responsibility, how much notice was given of additional hours, um, are these hours going to attract overtime or penalty rates, and can they truly be negotiated? And have a look at the case example which is given there, um, and uh, um, it uh, refers to the fact that there really wasn't any, it was uh, Aldi Foods and TWU, it refers to the fact there really wasn't any capacity to negotiate at all. So it, in that respect, it breached the uh, National Employment Standards. Uh, Division 3 of Part 2.2 again, 
the protections in 3 1 of the Fair Work Act um, might mean that dismissal for refusing to work additional hours could be a breach of the Act. So I guess that puts some teeth into the negotiating power that uh, the parties are meant to, uh, to to have or the employees meant to have and have a look at the case which is provided there as an example uh, where um, uh, being dismissed um, after being asked to work all the hours necessary to keep the business afloat was um, seen to be a breach of uh, the protections. Uh, hours and safety. The case that's probably the more famous of the two of these is the Kohler and Cerebos case and uh, it's really referred to uh, more often in the context of work cover so um, uh, do have a look at it because you'll see it. You will see it coming up um, again. It'll get another mention uh, if you st if you continue to work in this area. But Kohler and Cerebos involved a sales rep who, right from the outset, said uh, that she would never be able to cover the territory that she had been given. Now, she became quite stressed over that and uh, subsequently made an injury claim. Um, the court rejected the claim, but more not because. Um, uh, she hadn't uh, suffered some sort of an injury, but because they said in the circumstances that it, it wasn't foreseeable. Uh, while it might have been foreseeable that the person was going to have to be working pretty hard to cover the territory she'd been given, uh, the court accepted that it wasn't necessarily foreseeable that she'd become sick. Whereas in Johnston Bloomsbury, the n just the sheer number of hours, it was accepted that uh, the doctor would eventually become ill. Um, if required to continue to work that sort of hours. But do have a look at Kohler and Cerebos because it's one of those cases that does tend to pop up a lot. Now, this is the bit that uh, we're all interested in, our public holidays. Um, there are... Um, the argument here that I need you to just take uh, note of is the fact that while public holidays are um, enshrined in the Fair Work Act, so they're acknowledged and recognised, um, I think what the authors are getting at from about 11.16 on in the text is they're not actually, if you like, um, set in stone. There's an entitlement to take uh, public holidays, but you still might have some argy-bargy about whether or not um, an employer may reasonably ask you to work on that date. And so there's a range of factors to consider if it's reasonable to ask you to work on a public holiday. But note again that individual workers' circumstances have to be taken into account and they may be sufficient to decline a reasonable request. So as we said before with overtime, again here, uh, it might be it might be quite a reasonable request from the point of view of the employer, but from the employee's point of view, it uh, there may be sufficient reason to decline the request. They're paid at an ordinary rate, so you don't get all of the uh, loadings and penalties that you might ordinarily get. They're usually defined by reference to state legislation and that's why we have um, holidays at different times throughout the country. Uh, but it does allow for sub agreement about substitution of days. Um, modern awards, penalty rates, extra days off for rostered employees are, are um, a couple of the topics that are covered in modern awards around public holidays. The provisions regarding annu annual leave start with a discussion around the national employment entitlements. So Section 87 of the Fair Work Act says uh, there'll be four weeks leave a year for people who've worked on a continuous basis um, on ordinary hours and they'll be paid out at the base rate. Um, shift workers will get an extra week. The um, annual leave that we all get accumulates so it doesn't um, disappear um, after any particular period of time. and. Uh, Note that uh, it is open to an employer to direct someone to take um, annual leave. A couple of arguments as to why that's so. I mean, one of them is that leave is meant to keep an employee um, on the top of their game and well and rested, etc. Um, so that's why you'll often see disputes regarding people who've gone off on leave and then taken a second job. Um, so it is possible for employers to do that. Um, it's equally possible for the employer to be concerned about the uh, amount of liability on the books for holidays, so in any event there can be a direction to take leave. If there's no award or enterprise agreement in place, an employee can just automatically cash out uh, their leave. They can make an application for that to happen. If there's an award or an enterprise agreement, it's only allowed if it's allowed for in the instrument or if it's been and uh, that it's uh, 
uh, requested and agreed in writing and an employee is required to keep a four week leave balance up their sleeve. It's got to be paid for at the time it's taken. So you'll see from the cases um, referred to in the textbook that um, it's not possible, for example, to pay in advance. You, c you can't pay an employee an additional um, sum and so the uh, leave is p has to be paid out at the time that the leaves have been taken. And uh, uh, the issue about the loading of 17.5%, um, historically, I think the union's argument was that things were more expensive around holiday time and um, they asked for an additional loading. I, I don't know that anybody really knows where it comes from, but it may be removed in an agreement, so it can be rolled into um, a, uh, a, 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 a more generous rate. And of course, holiday uh, loading uh, can definitely be taken away by um, ag agreement where an employee um, enters into a flexibility agreement or another contract that's um, much more uh, lucrative than the than the base rate. But uh, yeah, still not um, unheard of to receive 17.5% loading on, on your usual hours when you take your leave. Personal leave, formerly perhaps sick leave, um, now includes sick leave and carer's leave, so caring for um, other household or family members. Uh, 10 days a year. It uh, does accumulate. It's paid out at the base rate. Also includes two extra days of unpaid leave um, if you run out. And um, interestingly, it's not one of those types of leaves that is normally paid out on termination. So um, one of the first things people often do is have a look at their enterprise uh, agreement uh, to see whether the um, group has been able to negotiate for that to be paid out. Some arguments around around that, particularly around safety um, as a way of rewarding people at a dangerous site. So some mine sites, for example, um, may allow um, sick leave to be accumulated and paid out, but I'm not sure that that's a continuing trend. The idea being that um, safe workplace where uh, people were not being injured and taking their sick leave would entitle them to walk away with that sick leave in due course. But uh, generally that's not the case. Personal leave under the National Employment uh, Standards also includes two days compassionate leave. Um, that's where someone is uh, seriously injured or there's been a death in the household. Again, paid at the base rate, but unpaid for casuals. Section 107 requires the employee to give notice to the employer as soon as possible, um, or as soon as practicable, to provide evidence which would satisfy a reasonable person. Not necessarily a medical certificate, uh, whatever might reasonably satisfy a, re a, uh, a reasonable person that um, the incident has occurred. Um, awards and agreements, they might be more specific and require a doctor's certificate. Usually the case if a person's taking more than a couple of days off. can be cashed out if it's in the agreement, but you always have to leave a balance of 15 days. The um, next big issue um, is parental leave and uh, the discussion regarding parental leave starts in the textbook um, at uh, 11.30. So generally f generally parental leave is for employees who have at least 12 months service. Um, they're entitled to 12 months unpaid leave um, either for themselves or uh, if, if um, they are the partner who has the responsibility for care of a child. So it might be the father, for example, who decides to take the uh, leave if they're going to have the uh, principal uh, care of the uh, of the child. They can ask for another 12 months, and it can only be refused on reasonable business grounds. As we heard before, for those other examples where people were making an application uh, to extend something or to uh, to uh, negotiate changes of hours, etc. So it can only be refused on reasonable business grounds. And also parental leave refers to these issues around um, making requests for flexibility. Dealt with in Division 5, Part 2.2 of the Fair Work Act. Requires 12 months service, as I've said. Does include casuals. So it is possible for a casual to apply for unpaid parental leave and come back to their casual job if they've had regular and systemic work and uh, they um, have a reasonable expectation that their job would continue. They can also apply for a safe job transfer um, even if they're under 
12 months. So if they're working as a casual um, or or if they're working full-time but have only been there for um, less than 12 months, they can still apply for a transfer to a safe job so they can keep working. Interestingly about this, um, the law-making power in the Act, this is one of the sections that doesn't, where you don't have to be a national system employer. The, um, this part of the Act relies on the external affairs power and um, the textbooks refer specifically to um, the ILO's Workers with Family Responsibilities Convention and there's a reference there to uh, where you can find that uh, particular uh, convention. So it applies to everyone, all, all um, employees um, uh, in the ordinary uh, context. Um, parental leave applies to the birth of a child or adoption, which is an interesting um, extension. Um, you have to have responsibility for the child's care, so it's only the carer who's applying. Uh, provide 10 weeks notice if that's practicable. Um, evidence can be asked for by the uh, employer. And when the leave is taken, if both parties are working for the same employer, there can be a period of eight weeks where they can take it concurrently. So they both can take uh, eight weeks off together to look after a new baby and do that concurrently. Now remember we're talking about unpaid leave here, just the capacity to return to work. So each parent can take uh, up to 12 months. I'm sorry, and what I mean by that is that if two employees were both um, working in the same workplace, each of them could take uh, 12 months off at the same time. An employee may ask for a second 12 months unpaid leave, uh, provided their employer, sorry, their, their um, employee partner hasn't already taken it. So they can ask for a second 12 month period, and as we've heard a couple of times now, that request can only be rejected on reasonable business grounds, so have a look at section 76. Can't be challenged in a court, but could be referred to the dispute resolution process, um, as we heard previously, for other requests for flexibility. Um, starting leave should start uh, within six weeks of the expected date of birth. Um, an employer may ask um, a, a pregnant employee to produce a medical certificate confirming that they are fit to continue to work over that last six weeks. You'd imagine that would be where there would be reasonably heavy lifting or some sort of physical activity required. Uh, but in any case, an employee uh, may ask for a medical certificate. Um, again, an interesting development under 79 capital A. Uh, it was the case that the employee couldn't break their leave. Now they can have uh, 10 days break um, and uh, just to keep in touch and uh, still remain on uh, maternity leave. Um, from the employee's point of view while they're on leave, some interesting protections. Section 83, the employer has to keep the employee advised of significant changes to their position while they're on leave. So the example that I've seen there in the university has been people who've been away on, on um, maternity leave have been kept abreast of what's going on with restructures within the organisation. So they've got to be included in that and they continue to receive the emails, etc., the information, uh, invitations to come to briefing sessions. And if their own position or their own role is likely to uh, be affected, they might even be um, uh, invited to attend an interview to provide feedback. Um, they must be entitled to return to their old position, otherwise maternity leave just doesn't work. Uh, but if their position doesn't exist any longer for whatever reason, they need to be put into something that's near uh, to the old job, both in status and in pay. And you should have a look at some of the related entitlements that affect that. Um, related leave. Now, Section 80 uh, allows for special maternity leave where a person is ill or the child dies close to uh, the date of uh, expected birth. Note also Section 85 allows for pre-adoption leave. So uh, a person who's going through interviews and paperwork, etc., may take some, uh, some leave pre-adoption. And um, uh, also on the topic of related leave, uh, note 
have a look at 11.33 in your textbook um, and step through what happens where a person on the advice of their doctor needs to seek to move from their current employment to a more appropriate safe job. Now I can th what I can think of there I suppose is someone perhaps working in a warehouse where they are usually pushing product around and uh, would like to continue to working. There's no reason why they couldn't do something which was more appropriate um, in the same workplace. Um, on the advice of the doctor the employer might need to find that for them. If there's nothing available the incentive is that they may be entitled to take paid leave um, and that will continue right up until um, it's time for them to uh, give birth and, and uh, leave the workplace anyway. So six weeks uh, beforehand it is possible for the employer to assess if the person is now unfit for work and at that stage they can be directed to start their maternity leave but I think that would be slightly fraught. I suspect that would be done more as on a negotiated basis. Um, the text refers to the, the ongoing discussions uh, as at this date regarding paid parental leave. I guess all you really need to know because it's in such a state of flux that it's not so much um, paid leave as uh, a government scheme. It is subject to changing eligibility and there's been continuing debate about whether people could um, so-called double dip, that is receive a benefit from their workplace if they were lucky enough to do that and uh, still make application for, the, for payment under the government scheme. At the moment it extends out to about 18 weeks and it's fixed by reference to minimum wage. It also includes what they call uh, dad and partner pay but have a look at the textbook on that topic. Uh, f final two uh, issues are around uh, long service leave. The Fair Work Act um, you'll see, and I think we talked about this earlier, relies pretty much on the states to um, uh, to quantify long service leave. There are however provisions in the Fair, Fair Work Act, which I don't really need you to know much about, which do um, uh, seek to preserve previous arrangements. And I guess the uh, drafters were, were conscious of the fact that uh, there could be a 10 year plus lead time for people who were carrying um, uh, long service leave entitlements when the Act came in. But in any event, uh, the provisions um, are override a federal award or an agreement. So the state provisions um, override a federal award or an agreement. So you look to your state legislation to see how long service leave is going to work for you. And have a look at the table um, in the textbook at uh, 11.40, which sets out um, the entitlement um, after a particular period of service. So in Queensland, for example, the entitlement is two months after a period of 10 years and um, there is an entitlement to a pro rata payout after you've been there for at least seven years and yes, you can ca uh, cash out your long service. Not the case in other states. Community service leave, unpaid leave for any reasonable uh, absence is allowed. Note the comments um, from the textbook authors regarding jury duty. Employers are generally required to top up the ordinary hours pay up to 10 hours. So a juror will receive something from the state and uh, the employer might be required to top that up up to a maximum of 10 hours. So that's my comments on the things that I'd like you to take a note of in chapter 11. And uh, as I said, an interesting uh, chapter, not too long. Uh, hopefully an easy enough read, but do make sure that you also look through the um, uh, the Fair Work Act at those particular sections as you proceed through. And next week uh, we'll have a look at, um, for a start, uh, control, performance management and discipline before we talk about a couple of other topics. So um, another interesting week next week. We'll talk again soon.